Good morning. Um, hope everybody's enjoyed last night. Um, I think everybody did here on, on stage today. Um, my name is Matthias Youngman. I'm a, a co-founder of Atomico and a partner there. Uh, we invest you know, from early stage on. Uh, but today, we're going to talk a bit about the, the later stage funding, the, the uh, $10 million uh, and, and beyond. Um, it's a it's an area I'm fascinated about, and I feel privileged to have the best group of people to talk about this. Um, I'm, I'm obsessed, which I'm sure most of these people are here too, about what it takes to, for Europe to create the next $100 billion company, and I believe that actually solving these, the problem of the later stage funding could be one of the reasons that, 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 that allow us to create these companies. Um, we, I actually wrote a blog post about it the other day, so if you want to hear exactly my views on it, you can, you can check it out. Um, but I think there's three components uh, that are really exciting about Europe at the moment. We have actually, on the capital side, uh, there's 348 deals that, uh, that were Series A deals that happened in the last year, uh, and that's up 34%, so it's looking healthy, it's strong. On the talent side, Europe actually has been strong for, for many years. We produce, believe it or not, twice as many STEM students as the US does every year. We have 4.7 million developers compared to the US of so 4.1, so talent is healthy. And then engagement is, is also pretty good. Uh, we had 1.6 million people going to 54,000 events in Europe. And it's not just the hubs of, of like London and Helsinki and Stockholm, but actually all across uh, Europe. So I think the ecosystem's super healthy. Um, but again, you know, we have to deal with this issue of raising the 10 million because I think that's uh, 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 an area that, that a lot of us and a lot of you founders out there have to, to fight for. Um, and and uh, what we kind of had a little discussion beforehand and. I saw the stats that, that basically there's 300 deals above $10 million. And of those, about 190 this year uh, were of uh, the 10 to 25 million. And then it drops off pretty quickly for the other rounds. Um, and I just thought I'd start off, um, actually I'll open it up to all of you, um, in terms of what does it take to raise $10 million? What does a company need to do? And I think we're going to have very different perspectives here because I'm going to introduce you quickly. So we have Beezer Clarkson who uh, comes from Sapphire Ventures and she invests in, in, in other funds, mostly focused on the US, but comes from very good insight in terms of what we can learn from, from the US side. Fred Destam pro probably doesn't need much of an introduction, an icon here in Europe uh, on the investment side. So, uh, and then Sebastian as well, I think we, they just mentioned Klarna two seconds ago, and Sebastian obviously a founder and, and a veteran in the, in the, in the tech industry. So the question, you know, what does it take um, if I open it up? I mean, I think maybe the first comment to make is that you're raising a seed of a million or a small series of two million is really quite different from raising 10 million and, and over. And what I've, what I've learned, you know, coming back from the US two years ago, is that European entrepreneurs still probably underestimate uh, how much scrutiny they're going to come under. Um, so we're going to look at cohort data. We're going to ask for cuts on your data that you don't even know you had. And I think it's super important for founders, you know, when they've raised their seed round, to immediately start like grabbing that data, even if you don't have the analytics, you know, drop it in a database somewhere, make sure you're logging everything so that by the time you come to your Series A or maybe six months before, three months before, you start to analyze that stuff so that you're not surprised when you go through the fundraising process by the amount of scrutiny you're going to get. Um, it's almost like planning for an IPO process. You know, it takes a, I did it at Zoopla. It takes a freaking year and it's mm -hmm. heavy. And I think getting ready for scale capital, 10, 15, 20, 25, you know, requires the same level of of preparation in a company that's really focused on execution, doesn't have money, doesn't have tools, mm -hmm. and so it's kind of hard to do, but it needs to be done. I want to underscore what you said, Fred. So Sapphire has both 
an LP vehicle that I, we, I work with, and then we have a growth fund that invests directly at the 10, 15, 20 million dollar range in US and Europe. And I can tell you, regardless of where we're investing at the growth stage, the business fundamentals become critically important and understanding what is happening inside the company, who are you selling to, what are the customers, what are the data usage, what are people doing with the tool. It goes beyond the technology risk, which is more of the question at the early stage investing and moves into more of execution. And that's, that's what we see very clearly when you're into the 10 million plus range check size. And I mean, Sebastian, I'd love to get your view because you've been in the trenches dealing with this for, for many years. And I mean, there's, there's loads of perspectives you can obviously bring and experience, so, so I'd love to hear it. Well, I think that at least for the companies I met, you can really put them in two categories. You're either, <clears throat> by the time you raise $10 million, you either have a functioning revenue model, and then it's so much more just about like, how that's growing and what the growth rates look and what the margins look in that, right? Or you're in the other category of like, I have X million of users, <laughs> and how much is that growing? And really this too, and, and, and me obviously coming from more the revenue, we've always had like a functioning business model that was set from day one. Um, I get very impressed by people who raise $10 million just by number of users. Um, but I guess, but still to, to your previous point, I mean there's a lot of cohort data and usage as well, right? Like what's your uh, monthly active users and you know, what's your churn rate and how much do they come back and how much do they engage with what you have? That, said something about your future revenue potential in combination with revenue growth. I mean, so but I it's, tough, it's tough right now, uh, we think, right? But when you started off, it was, the world was so different, right? And, and I would say it was a factor of 10 maybe more difficult. And I would just love to get your perspective on, on that, you know, what you had to do to get there. Because people like you who've been able to trailblaze and make it happen, you know, it's a great inspiration for everybody here in terms of how did you make it happen? How did you get there? What was, because you're, I mean, you're, I, I find you one of the most ambitious entrepreneurs that I know and sort of like, you, you keep fighting and, and I think there's a part of that, that that's required here. Yeah, I think, I mean, I guess that like, to me when it comes to dealing with investors, I mean, in the early days it's basically, look, what are the problems uh, that we see? What's our solution to it? Why, how large is the addressable market? And then what's the team here to address it, right? And I think that that's fairly like a standard pitch. Um, but as you come up, it becomes more of, to me, a lot of traction in history. I mean, in, to be a little bit like uh, n not so nice, the least thing you want to do as an entrepreneur is hang out with investors. <laughs> <laughs> you want to like focus on your business and stuff. Yeah. But there is de definitely some valid, uh, you know, value into trying to have a, a good long-term relationship, right? Because I do see, and I see it myself as a business angel today as well, that like a lot of it is velocity, right? Which basically, okay, I met you two months ago. What did we speak about? What, was, what did it look like then? And what does it look like today? And, uh, and obviously like, the same I see in my relationships with investors is like, you know, my ability to tell them how things have changed and how it's developing between point A and point B I mean, is crucial, right? I think that's a super important point because I think it's Mark Suster who wrote that blog post about we invest in, in, in lines, not dots. Yeah. So we want touch points that show progress in a company and you can't show up two months before raising your yeah. 10 million and say, oh, I don't know who's out in the market. I've never met Index, Axel, Atomico, and I'm suddenly gonna show up on their doorstep with a nice pitch and raise the money. It kind of doesn't work that way, so you have to sort of, after you've raised your money, you know, start to build a relationship and have regular touch points and sort of almost make that of your, make, make that part of your discipline that you're building that relationship so that by the time you go and raise the money, we already know you, we love your vision, we think you're a person that we wanna back, and you know, we already are sort of, you know, bought into the, 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 the project that you're building, we already buy the narrative, and then we can just focus on, hey, you know, does this thing hang together as an investment proposition? But it can and backfire too, right? You know, like, like you know, you're, you're, you're talking to this investor and you're giving them all this information, and then the investor says, hey, well, you didn't, you didn't reach that goal, I thought you were gonna get there, you know what I mean? Like, so like, how, how do you balance that? You know, and, and what sort of situation, what do you, what do you say? I, I Look, my view on that is, sorry, go oh, ahead. Say, I think it's important to be transparent. These are people, yeah. investors are gonna be yeah. owning equity in a company and they're gonna be bumps in the road and yeah. all investors know that. So if you go into it already understanding what the history is and how somebody has overcome and come back that, you actually can have a lot more faith that that will continue to happen mm. in the future versus not knowing and then discovering it later that can actually be backfire in their own way that way. But I mean, I, I think we know that the plans are poetry, 
Yeah. We've been in the business long yeah. enough. You know, the number of companies that we have backed that go through turbulence, turmoil, yeah. you know, pivot, whichever way you want to describe it, it's part of our bread. And, you know, it's what we do every day. So I think you have to practice a form of radical transparency and you know, be clear about your strategy, what you're trying to achieve. And you know, it's life. Like we understand startup life, and I don't think people should be shy around it. I think the worst you can do is sort of paint. Um, a, a grandiose picture of your progress where you're making yourself sound like you're bigger than you are and then you know you, we meet you and we're like oh my god yeah. this company is so hot and then when you finally open the kimono and we see the numbers and we're like you got what 50,000 <laughs> MAUs like are you fucking kidding me I thought you had two and a half million by now and then and then you're fucked so it's much better to start and be open and like hey we got 10,000 users but look at the retention, look yeah. at the activation rates, look how well the population is yeah. behaving, and we're cool with small numbers. You it's, know, it's our job. Yeah, it's trust, isn't it? Ultimately, yeah. in some ways, you, you know, I, think, I think all of us, is, uh, it's not our first rodeo, right? We, we're, you know, we look at all these things, and there's ups and downs, and things that work and things that don't work, but ultimately, right. you know, we have to build that, that trust. I, with I also think one thing that's changed is that, again, like it's becoming, in a way, cheaper and cheaper to launch a company, in yeah. the sense that you yeah. don't need servers anymore, and you know, a lot of these infrastructure components that you used to have 10 years ago, right? And what I see, at least, is also that a lot of the companies that I follow and track today, and some of which I angel invest in myself, is the angel network is much stronger in Europe than it was 10 years ago when we launched. And like you see, you know, Eric and Alexander from SoundCloud doing investments in Berlin, and you see like, and to me, what I also found very encouraging is that a lot of founders, if they can get like a good you know, business angel from, you know, that maybe had launched their own company on board very early in this seed stage or A stage. That also helps a lot with the investor relationships, to be honest, because these will most often, often have a good network, know like how are different VCs compared to each other. And to me, it's also good because creating a little bit more pressure on the VCs to behave like in general, because when you do something that, you know, damages your reputation, it spreads extremely quickly in this, it, in this it, ecosystem. It's a great point. I mean, entrepreneurs should spend time getting to know their investors mm. and referencing the investors as well because it is a long-term partnership. Yeah. I mean, and you want to know who's going to be sitting around your table and hearing from other entrepreneurs how we as investors behave is critical. I mean, I, I, so I call that uh, board intimacy. <laughs> So um, if you can create an intimate board, it's a place where you can come with yeah. issues, concerns, yeah. things that you're really um, threaten the life of your company yeah. and not feel like you're going to get slammed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, maybe our plan for, ten year, yeah. uh, for next year was to make $10 million in revenue, but now we're realizing we don't have product market fit in a certain vertical, mm -hmm. and we're going to come back to the board and say, hey, we're going to make $6 million next year because we just don't think it's worth building the sales force in that vertical because we're not ready. And if you have an intimate board, Board, then everybody around the table can go like, you know what, we, we have to live in reality, not whatever the plan was, and adjust. And I think in general, I mean, these are the kind of investors you're looking for, but also as an entrepreneur, the more you're radically transparent, the more people will respect you for being open about what's, what's not working, right? So let's change tack here a little bit, and I'm going to uh, want to ask you uh, a few questions, because, um, you know, what I find interesting, again, on the data in Europe, there's about... 10 uh, funds that have over 250 million uh, here in Europe, right? And so, um, and, and, I, and I've, you know, from, from having been in venture now for almost 16 years, believe it or not, um, you sort of see that the growth of the funding sizes that we talked about, it's, you know, Sebastian and me talked about it earlier. So, so what, what is a Series B? And a Series B today, you know, it's very much yeah. 10 million and above. And when I started off, it was three, three to six million, right? And, and that was a solid one, right? Yeah. Uh, and you know, Angel was actually very much sub uh, one million. And so, even though it's cheaper than ever before to start a company, I think it t costs like fifteen thousand dollars to start a company today and get it off and get you know, you can even probably get a product out to scale. And the things that you're, you're taking on fintech, you know, healthcare, transport requires a lot more cash. And with ten funds with uh, over yeah. 250 million uh, in, in their last fund, if you compare that to the US, yeah. I think that would give us good insight in sure. terms of what, what, sure. what, what issues we're facing sure. here in Europe. There's a bit more money in the US, yeah. this is probably <laughs> not a surprise, but just to give some specific context, from just this year alone through Q3, so there's yeah. been more funds raised since the end of September, but I only have the numbers till then, there's been about 45 funds raised that are over 250 million. Wow. And that aggregates up to somewhere around 17 billion. And that's on the back of another 40-ish funds, maybe 45, that were raised last year in 2015. 
So there's, and I'll just look at it in a two-year uh, window because funds have been fundraising in the U.S. every two to three years. So that's sort of the fresh capital cycle that's available. Yeah. So there is a significant amount of money just in the U.S., that's really keen to invest in companies that are hitting a productive stage mm. and generating the metrics that they're talking about. And people, are, as you can see in the, your data, in the report you put out, there are a lot of U.S. investors coming to Europe. Yeah. Right? And a lot of European companies coming to sell in the U.S. And that's, that's where a lot of the marriage occurs. Yeah. And so I think the, the important corollary for the founders in the room <laughs> is that you're competing yeah. mm. against Absolutely. a ton of companies, yeah, yeah. right? Yep. If you're raising money, there's probably 100 companies raising money at the same time. Yeah. And that means any venture firm you go into is probably looking seriously at 10 projects yep. and is going to do one or two. And I think it's important to understand that what you're trying to do is get into our mind to such a level that we clear our agenda, we focus only on you, and we try and make it happen. And you need to be, you know, when you're raising growth capital from 10 funds, which is nothing, you need to be that special company. Yeah. And in a way, that, like sort of emerging from the pack as the company that we want to back, um, you know, is, 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 has gotten harder. Um, now, to gain, the other thing is you compete on a global basis. So we have full visibility on what's happening in the US, et cetera, and, so, and we think about companies globally, and so do US investors. Yeah. So in a way, you know, when, when you look at Deliveroo, right, they raised $475 million, mm. and you know, a lot of that money came from DST, Bridgepoint, Green Oaks, all these US mm. late stage guys, because they look globally and they say, oh, this is the biggest food delivery company 2.0 in the world, you know, it's the emerging winner, let's go plow capital into it instead of putting it in DoorDash. But and so you're always competing on a global basis, but if you break through, then you also have access to capital on a global basis. I love that point because, you know, what we, we call it internally, we have our own version of Stockholm Syndrome, <laughs> where you think you're the best in your, in your town, or you sort of feel like, I feel pretty good because I'm, I'm the biggest guy in town, and it's a small town, right? Yeah. Uh, and the world, is, it's competitive, and so, you know, I know that, you know, you guys are competing globally now, and if you, you got to beat the big guys, right? And, and I think that's, that's so important. There is, but I'm, at some time, I'm not too worried about Europe either, because I also, I mean, I was in San Francisco on Monday, and it's like, yeah. it's so intoxicating, I love the energy, but there's also so much bullshit, and like, uh, and it's like, I mean, I've seen, I've seen uh, American VCs force uh, yeah. European tech companies to open an engineering office in Silicon Valley, which is like one of the stupidest things that you can come up with. And like, because like, how are you going to compete with the talent in that space, totally. yeah. in everything else that's going on? And it's not that that talent is like 10 times smarter than it is back in Europe. Yeah. Um, so and the it's point a bit is, more expensive in the Bay Definitely Area. Though more expensive. <laughs> and and harder extremely, retain. <laughs> and less loyal, right? Yeah. Because if you're an yeah. engineer in San Francisco and you haven't switched jobs in the last year, that's a sign that you're a poor engineer, apparently. So, um, so I think that like, you know, I find it always funny. I watch Silicon Valley and I laugh at the show, but no one I've ever asked in San Francisco is watching it, and they don't think it's funny at all. So that tells, to, to me, too, tells everything it, about it. Too close to home. home. Too close to home. <laughs> so it's like, but the point is that like, I think there's a lot of overhyped things about San Francisco and, and, and the Valley that yeah. at some point of time is gonna come and bite them. It's yeah. a fair um, point, there's and, a lot And even of though the amount of cash is not at the same level here, uh, a lot of companies that shouldn't get funded probably get funded there. Yeah. And there is a valuation discount in Europe. It's just one to live with. But on the other hand, there's a lot of other advantages of being here as well. So, so. This is a lot of reasons why U.S. investors enjoy being part of the European ecosystem. Because right. in the Bay Area, you do have a ton of capital. You have companies being funded that are me too, not interesting, not innovative. And when you come to Europe, you can see innovation that's being expressed completely differently. Right. Valuations aren't always less, but they can be. Um, it's, there's a lot to be very attractive. I would say so, they are less. <laughs> Many times, at least it, but in the early stages. I mean, yeah. maybe by B round and so forth, they start like... If things get competitive, more, they can yeah, get better, yeah, I'm just but, saying. But, but I think the, the, to get back to your point, in a way, at some point, we need international capital Absolutely. if we're going to build big companies mm -hmm. because we just don't have enough depth, right? Yeah. Like you said, so Atomico, Axel, Index, yeah. Yeah. You know, e yeah. EQT, yeah. Lake Star. That's like five, and then yeah. a couple in France. There's like five, seven, maybe ten funds that are yeah. that are large, and so you're gonna you need that access to capital. The good news is the U.S. investors are perfectly happy as long as they have a strong local partner to help companies grow. And yeah. then the acquirers, because you know, Facebook's in Paris and London, and yeah. you know, and Google's in London in a big way, they have all that offshore cash. Mm. So what's different from the past is they're perfectly happy to acquire a team that has engineering in 
Gothenburg and you know, uh, commercial HQ maybe in San Fran or whatever it may be. So we don't have that sort of discount on exit that we used to have. So I think for startups, it's like, hey, I need a strong, recognizable brand and a guy on my board who's local to me can help me recruit. And then if I'm with the right people around the table, I'm making progress, then that acts as like a super highway so that I can access that global capital when I'm really scaling. And it's nice when the capital that you're bringing in at the later stages dovetails to where some of your customers are, because it can also help on the other side of your yeah. super highway. Right. right. But, but, I, but I also, it, sorry, go for it. How is it on the, I'm curious, because I'm not an investor myself, but like, at least the people I know, like the common share structures are more common in Europe. Yeah. While like in the US it's almost a standard to have liquidation preferences yeah. and all that kind of stuff, which really hypes the you know the valuations quite a lot. Is that is is there a difference in, in typical terms? So, I, there I mean, can be. I, I mean I think we've seen structured deals in a few cases in the US where people were really hyping up the value and they were sort of making a pact with the devil, right? Which is like, if I hit all my numbers, the structures go away. If I don't, you know, we're rebasing the valuation. Right. I, I can talk for us, like we never, ever do that kind of shit and we really don't recommend it because it's just wrong. It's like you're sort of trying to arbitrage the risk profile of a company that's fundamentally risky mm. and where the path is uncertain and you're misaligning everybody. It's almost like people have an incentive for you to fail so yeah. they can rebase the valuation. It's just dumb, right? But so I think it's very important. Preference is not a big issue. Preference is just designed so that you can't take the cash out and your investors have been paid back. Like it's not a big deal, but anything that's like participating preferred or ratchet Ratchets. base, and you know, like you should never touch that you, stuff. You, I you think it's a, a bad sign. A lot of that behavior when companies were pushing for certain valuations and they wanted the valuation and they were willing to make all these different trades to get the investor to hit a valuation. And the, the challenge is you can create a valuation right. based on these things, but it doesn't help the company and it certainly doesn't help the employees. And, and I think, I, actually, that's something I've heard from European founders more yeah. than I heard from US ones, is that, which is, to me, surprising but quite impressive, is that like, I've heard European founders behind extremely successful companies tell me, you know what, I'm actually not going to push for that extra increase yeah. in valuation. Totally. I'd rather take a somewhat lower valuation yeah. And then basically, I mean, the dilution effect is going to be not that big of a difference, yeah. but the pressure you put on the company to deliver yeah. when you set that uh, like totally overhyped valuation just becomes much harder. The fun thing about it is also it creates much more competitiveness because if the investors can't really compete yeah. on just valuation anymore, it really becomes about network and reference and like, you know, how supportive there's, can the investor there's be? There's a big issue, I think, in terms of people getting overexcited of hitting a number, yep. you know, yeah. and uh, that gets them excited. And I think, like you say, they then have to work for it. And, and you don't know, like we, we're, all of us are in these businesses where it goes up and down. So actually being a bit steady on that one and then working with people that you really want to work with, I think mm. that's the most important thing. And I think being a founder, and I, you know, I'm, I'm impressed, for example, with you, Sebastian, in terms of how strong you are, in terms of what you want and what you demand. And I think that's really, really important too, that you sort of sort of say, look, these are my boundaries, this is how I'm working, are we okay to work together on these terms? Because mm. I think it has to work both ways, and I think you, you need founders to work together with your investors, but you also need founders who sort of say, say look, this is, this, is, this is the parameters, because that sets the right relationship, because there's multiple players, and you have to handle loads of stakeholders, and, and if you're not managing them in the right way, it gets really confusing. Yeah. I mean, I, so I think closing statements, because we're out of time, but yeah. <laughs> There is scale capital. Absolutely. You gotta, you gotta have to prove that you've solved the problem for customers, that you have some traction. We still buy into vision. We buy into founders. We take risks. But when you come to growth, you know you gotta be ready with probably way more metrics yeah. yep. and way more proof points than you need. So start collecting the data. Start analyzing it so that when you come and talk to us, we're gonna love you as entrepreneurs, but we're also gonna check your numbers. And you gotta be able to do both. Well said. Well said. We have we have. A couple of seconds here, but I, I think we're, we're pretty much done. So uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you guys. Thank you, everybody. Have a thank great you. slush.